Okay, welcome. Uh, today I just want to talk to you about some of the issues in relation to self-managed super funds, and this discussion is only on self-managed super funds, some of the implications of death, and also some of the implications where you may wish to appoint a power of attorney in relation to your self-managed super fund. So I've got a couple of notes on the board. An important part of this is to always to remember under the CISAC what is the definition of a self-managed super fund, and that is one of the major issues is that all members must be directors, and all directors must be members. Okay, very important point. So here's an example of our self-managed super fund. Uh, this is, say, dad and mum in the fund. Typically, we should have a corporate trustee of the super fund, and then typically, dad and mum are directors. Remembering that all directors must be members, and all members must be directors. So at this point in time, this fund's all, all okay. Typically, also, in the corporate trustee, which is a company, we have shareholdings, and typically, a corporate trustee would be set up with, for example, dad owning 12 shares and mum owning 12 shares. So they're 50-50, and inside the fund they may be roughly 50-50. That doesn't really matter. So that's all fine. Now, let's consider the situation that the possibility is that either mum or dad um, may be becoming uh, incapacitated, they might have had a stroke, they may be getting old, uh, they may be... Um, Oh, planning to leave the country for a period of time. There's a host of reasons why either dad or mum may not be in the position to be able to continue to be the director of this company or may not be able, may not be uh, capable of carrying on that, on, that, um, on that role. So what do we do about it? Um, one of the issues or one of the possibilities is for either dad or mum to appoint an enduring power of attorney. Okay, often abbreviated as enduring power of attorney. That's an E. Enduring power of attorney. Now, um, in appointing a person as an enduring power of attorney, that power under that legal document, which by the way must be prepared by your solicitor, appoints a person to take on that role. And look, that might be the son. Let's just say the son is appointed under that document. When that happens, when the son is appointed, the son takes the place of the person. So let's assuming dad has appointed the son. The son takes over the power of dad. Now, it's a little bit of a misconception. The appointment under enduring power of attorney does not immediately put the son in dad's place as a director. What it does is puts the son in control of dad's 12 shares because he takes the place. So the son effectively becomes the shareholder. Now as a shareholder, the shareholders vote to determine who the directors are. So the son, now who owns, or is deemed to own those 12 shares, and mum get together and have a shareholder meeting, and at that shareholder meeting they appoint the son as the new director because dad has either resigned, and he may resign um, when he's of sound you know, mind and body, he just chooses he doesn't want to be a director anymore, or it may be that he is forced to resign or terminate because he's incapable of acting. And if you are incapacitated mentally, you cannot fulfil a director's role. So there's two examples of how that might happen. So now we have the son who is a director in Dad's place because he has gone through this process, taken control of Dad's shares, had a meeting, appointed himself as a director, or the meeting has appointed the son as a director. So now the son and the mother are directors of the um, super fund. Now, you may well say, well, hang on, don't we have a problem here? Because now all the members are not directors. Very important point. Because now mum and dad are still members. But mum is a director, but dad is no longer a director. So on the face of it, we've got a problem. Fortunately, Section 17.3 of the CIS Act covers this and basically says that where a person is made a director or is appointed as a director by way of an enduring power of attorney, then that is okay. okay. So that is one way that we can replace in the lifetimes of these people a person um, as a director of the corporate trustee of the super firm. Now let's just look at the situation where um, mum or dad pass away. So let's assume that um, once again, poor old dad has died. Now, when dad dies, is 
member balance in the super fund must be dealt with. Now we need to look at the trustees and various other documents, but basically Dad's member benefit in the super fund must be dealt with by the trustees generally within a period of six months. Okay? The law gives around about six months for this to happen. The law then also provides, and, and also this section also provides that in those circumstances it's possible for the legal personal representative of Dad to step in as a director. Now how does that happen? Well first of all, Dad will have a will and if he hasn't got a will, he should have a will and this is a very good example why he needs one. Under Dad's will, he will have made provision for whom his legal personal representative will be and that's typically the executor or is known as the executor. Okay, the executor. So the executor is determined by Dad's will. That's not an enduring power of attorney. An enduring power of attorney only is applicable during the lifetime of the person he gives it. Once you're dead, that's gone and the will takes over and the will will name the executor. Now in this case, let's assume that Dad has appointed his son under his will as his executor. So what happens? Similar to the other situation, the son now as executor takes ownership of Dad's 12 shares. Okay. They are fit, theoretically registered in the son's name as trustee for the estate of Dad. So the son now has the 12 shares in his name. He similarly gets together with Mum. They have a shareholder meeting and in the shareholder meeting they appoint son as a director. So it's a similar sort of mechanism to the other mechanism under the power of attorney that the son ended up as a director, but there is a process that must take place. The point I want to illustrate is that merely because the son is named as the executor does not automatically put him in the position as the director of the super fund. Must go through this process. Okay. Once that has happened and the son is a director with mum, then he has very significant power. In your estate planning for your super fund then, Dad needs to be very careful and think carefully through his affairs because if his son is the director, he has the power up here with mum to vote and make decisions in relation to the death benefits of Dad. If there are no binding death benefit nominations and no other rules in place, then the trustees, this meeting of mum and dad, uh, sorry, of son and mum, will determine where dad's death benefit goes to. Okay. Now let's take the next example. Let's assume that mum may be incapacitated or maybe mum died in the same car crash as dad or think of anything you like. If mum is deceased, okay, and let's assume also that maybe the son could be mum's legal person representative or executor, it's possible that the son effectively could take 100% control of that super fund. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if dad's and mum's wishes were that, let's say there's three children, three kids involved, and they wished that that super fund money ultimately ended up a third each, okay, which is not uncommon as well. However, if the son has effective control, there is nothing to stop him saying, okay, all of dad's benefit, and let's assume this is son number one, who is the same person as son number one over here, there's nothing to stop him shooting all that money and paying it to himself. And there's nothing really that could be challenged about that. These other two children can't say, oh, that's not fair, or dad and mum wish this or wish that. In the absence of any binding nomination or any other formal agreement in place, um, the son has the power to do that. The point here is that be very careful who your legal personal representative is under your will because maybe one day that person takes control or is effectively will be the replacement director and in turn will have significant power in the determination of where death benefits may be paid or even not the extreme of persons. People dying, they may, all, may well be making significant decisions in relation to the investments of that super fund. An important point, basically what we would say, you need to come and talk to us 
and go through the overall picture of um, dad and mum and their estate planning, what children are involved and build a picture all up before we, yeah, before mum and dad made decisions about who their legal person representatives may be and also in the, the consideration of who a, an enduring power of attorney may be in relation to the family. Estate planning, very important. Thanks for listening.